Over its first two seasons, Love, Death and Robots has made good on its name by offering myriad animated shorts spanning sci-fi and horror, and occasionally both at the same time. It's been bloody and visceral but also frequently uneven. For every smart treatise about the nature of humanity, there was a gorifice that was bloody and shocking and little else. But with Volume 3, we get arguably the strongest collection yet. Nine genre shorts without a weak link among them. It's a buffet. Exit Strategies the first direct sequel in love, death and robots history from the mind of acclaimed sci-fi novelist John Scalzi. The titular trio of droll droids return to take a whirlwind tour studying post-apocalyptic human survival strategies before mankind was finally snuffed out. Love. Once again, these three robots are buddies who certainly share strong platonic love. Death. Various human corpses the robots find in increasingly compromising positions. It's pretty morbid, but also very funny. The fall of mankind is actually comedic. Robots. Right there in the title. Does it work? Because the joke behind the robots' vacation is the same as it was in season 1, the jokes in this three robots sequel aren't as funny as they were the first time. But it's still oddly charming to see the robots tour the dilapidated remains of human civilization, making pointed jokes about how tech billionaires thought they could survive the apocalypse without any survival skills. The kicker at the end of this one is basically the same as the one in the first short, but somehow more hilarious. Bad traveling, a shark hunting sailing vessel is attacked by a giant crustacean whose size and intelligence is matched only by its appetite. Mutiny, betrayal, and ventriloquism with a corpse welcome aboard the animation directing debut of David Fincher. Love. There isn't much love among crewmates certainly the man who proclaims himself leader doesn't agree with his crew's moral decisions. But the crustacean creature apparently loves human flesh. Death. Loads. Gotta keep the creature fed, after all. The body count in this one is brutal, though a lot of the actual flesh-eating happens off-screen. Robots? None at all. This short definitely leans on age-of-sail technology, even though it takes place on a distant planet. It's mostly wheels, rigging, and sails instead of smart AI. Does it work? Keeping the story contained on the ship adds to the heightened suspense and suspicion. Who's an ally and who's an enemy? Who would rather unleash the creature onto thousands of innocent civilians, and who would sacrifice themselves to save those people? It's tense and eerie, leading to a satisfying conclusion. Actually, it's almost like Among Us, if Among Us took place on a pirate ship on a distant planet, and also involved a human devouring crab monster. Yes. Did Burton go? The very pulse of the machine. The hook is trying to decipher whether Kibbleson is hallucinating, or the moon itself is trying to communicate with her through her altered mental state. Confused and panicked and exhausted, she takes more drugs. And now I see with Iserine. The very pulse of the machine. This is a quote from William Wordsworth's poem She Was a Phantom of Delight, but it's also how the embodiment of EO tries to explain its supposed machine status. When Kibbleson views the moon in the electromagnetic spectrum, she sees its snaking, luminous wires, disappearing through the hole where Burton's eye once was, forming a highway into the data of her partially intact mind. Kibbleson, with only a minute of oxygen remaining to her, is implored by the voice of Eo to dive into a pulsing river of energy, to sacrifice her physical form, but preserve her mind forever, to live on within Eo, a machine with the stated purpose simply to know you. Kibbleson casts herself into the light and breaks down into nothing but atoms, but as the episode ends, her voice travels through radio waves and out into space. Night of the Mini Dead, a passionate romp in the graveyard quickly led to the zombie apocalypse, destroying everything from American suburban neighborhoods to the temples of Shaolin monks high in the mountains of China. From a handful of zombies to hordes, to giant mutant variations, the undead army pushed humanity to the brink of destruction, forcing the hand of the Kremlin and the White House to unleash all of its nuclear arsenal upon the Earth. In the end humanity's time on Earth was a fart in the cosmic wind in the universe. Why did the USA and Russia use nukes? The White House was one of the last locations left on Earth fighting against the undead horde, but ultimately was being overrun and in a state of panic the president decided to use the USA's nuclear arsenal against the undead. However, launching their nukes would have forced the hands of Russia, who in this mini-world, launched their nukes in retaliation. With no hope left for humanity, the nukes will destroy almost everything in its way, including the zombies. Kill Team Kill, 
After the death of some of the squad at the hands of the Bargast, Sergeant Morris led the other three remaining soldiers to a secret CIA base in the mountains that is home to some of the most dangerous CIA experiments and weaponry. Upon entering the base it was revealed that the Bargast had killed all of the soldiers inside, leaving only Sergeants Morris and Nielsen and Privates Folin and Macy to fight the cybernetic monstrosity. Together the soldiers attempted to ambush the Bargast but were instead ambushed themselves with Sergeant Morris savagely killed. Together, the three remaining soldiers brought the bear down, but it was a trick by the beast and Private Folin's leg is bitten clean off. In the end, Sergeant Nielsen and Private Macy destroy the bear, but it's the monster who has the last laugh when it releases its cybernetic eye and self-destructs, killing the remaining two soldiers. Bear of Mass Destruction, a genetically engineered grizzly bear is devastatingly powerful, able to tear through entire squads of elite military with ease. But, the bear's original purpose was to assist army personnel while out on patrol in the Afghan mountains. Why the bear malfunctioned is unknown, but it is likely due to its artificial intelligence and the bear's nature rebelling together against their former human masters. Even after blowing itself up, there is no guarantee the bear is dead and will likely spend the rest of its days murdering any unsuspecting soldiers and civilians in the Afghanistan mountains. Dr. Afriel. Swarm, in secret, Dr. Murney and Dr. Afriel were experimenting with artificially made pheromones and began controlling some of the workers of the ancient hive. Their plan was to use the genetic information of an egg to create a brand new queen, which would create its own hive and be used to better humanity's growing place in the galaxy. Unbeknownst to the human pair, their attempt to enslave a new hive activated an ancient protocol in the hive, giving birth to an intelligent being named Swarm that enslaves the mind of Dr. Murney, using her as a way to communicate with Dr. Afriel. Swarm reveals that when the hive is under threat, an intelligent being like itself is born to combat the threat. Acknowledging the potential threat of humanity, Swarm has decided centuries ahead of time to take the fight to humanity before it can threaten the hive. In order to combat humanity, Swarm will breed humans to fight humans and delivers an ultimatum to Dr. Afriel to remain a living intelligent creature and breed with the Swarm controlled Dr. Murney or die and be cloned anyway. In the end, Dr. Afriel decides to go along with Swarm's plan, potentially sealing humanity's fate for good. A tragic fate, the Swarm survived for millions of years thanks to being able to create an intelligent being that could lead them to victory. By breeding the very races they were threatened by they could raise them to combat their enemies without the risk of their queen being killed. Mason's Rats, Mason enlisted the help of a highly advanced pest control company to combat the intelligent rats that made a home for themselves in the barn. After destroying his first extermination system, the pest control company offered Mason the TT-15, a scorpion robot armed to the teeth to destroy rats. However, after Mason witnesses, the scale of violence carried out by the TT-15 and the rats' sadness at the death of their comrades, he helped the critters by dealing a death blow to the machine. Mason befriends the rats, and they toast their new friendship by consuming the liqueur that the rats made. In the end, Mason calls the bank to cancel the check he made out to the pest control company to get his money back for the TT-15. Does it work? This one is a good time. Sure, rats evolved to have basic warfare capabilities and must battle some high-powered exterminator robots for their freedom. Why the hell not? In vaulted hulls entombed deep in the mountains of Afghanistan, a squad of special forces soldiers has the dangerous job of recovering a hostage held by terrorists. But the real evil they must confront is an elder god of ancient and terrifying power. Love. Another situation where the love is more an unspoken bond between teammates. Not a whole lot of love this season. Death. Another situation where a team of soldiers uncovers the gory bodies of those who came before them, then slowly get picked off in increasingly gruesome ways. Robots? Not really. More like eldritch horrors unleashed by elder gods, unseen by modern humanity. Does it work? The parallels between involved hulls entombed and kill team kill are pretty clear. Both involve soldiers reckoning with violent forces beyond their understanding, which results in some gnarly deaths. Involved hulls entombed takes a more serious approach, however, leaning more into horror instead of humor.